Welcome in everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for February's virtual support group. Uh, my name is Kiana Hatfield and I'm the program director with Parkinson Association of the Carolinas. And today we have with us Dr. Cheryl Greenberg, um, who is a representative of AARP, and she will be talking to you all today about how to pre prepare to care for your loved ones or how to continue to care. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, today's session will be recorded and will be available for later view on our YouTube page um, later this week. Um, also, we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, feel free to um, leave your question in the chat box function um, at the bottom of your screens and we will answer those during the Q&A. Um, but without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Greenberg here. Um, thank you so much for being here. Hello, everybody. I am so pleased to be here today um, with you. I think that the topic today is something that's awfully important. Navigating care it can be stressful. It can be full of questions. And it also can be very, very rewarding. So um, let, me, let me start by saying again that I will be talking to you about some ideas about care, providing care, but I will leave time at the end for you to ask questions. Um, in that case, because this is recorded, because you'll hear other people's thoughts, I do want to ask you to be thoughtful about keeping whatever you hear to yourself, keeping things confidential and um, just being open to what you hear from me and from other people. I appreciate that. Um, I should tell you a little bit about who I am, I guess, so you know that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I am a, a volunteer for AARP. I have been very active uh, in AARP in terms of providing some educational programming and even some, I've uh, been participating in some of the leadership of the North Carolina AARP uh, chapters. But um, I come to you with a background in gerontology. I actually have a doctorate in gerontology. And when I am not volunteering, I'm working as a coach for folks who are older and with their families. And as you can imagine, when as people get older, questions come up all the time about care, providing care. What does that look like and how do I do it? So this is certainly a topic that's near and dear to my heart and something that I spend a lot of time talking about. Today, um, give me a second to bed. What I am not is a digital expert. And so now I've got to move your lovely faces out of my way. Um, one of the, what we will talk about today is creating a, a sort of a framework for what our caregiving looks like. There is no question in my mind that you are the experts in the room. I just touted my credentials, but I know that many or most of you are already providing care for someone special in your life. I don't begin to think that everything I say is going to be new to you, but I hope you will listen for ideas and information that makes you go, oh, wow, I didn't think of that before. And that's what I want you to listen for. And that's what I'd like you to jot down to think about more later. Okay. So you'll hear some things, you know, but you'll hear a lot of new things. I'm, I'm believe, I believe one of the things that um, I'm not going to talk a lot about, but I want to tell you is still in my mind is um, how to stay safe in the environment we live in today. And so I will come back to health safety for a little bit, but not in detail. And uh, then we'll talk about just, um, how do you make a plan for yourself? How do you make connections with other people who can be helpful to you? And also, what are some resources outside of your particular friend and family networks? If you like, and you want to know who else is in the room, you can take just a, just a second to put your name into the chat box, along with the relationship you have with the person you're providing care for. For example, you might put, I'm Sally from Raleigh, and I'm caring for uh, a close friend. And at your leisure, you can look at what people write in the chat box.
Now, I have presumed that you um, know all about caregiving and you are a caregiver or you're curious about caregiving. I'll tell you many, many people when I ask them if they are caregivers tell me no. Oh, no, no, I'm not a caregiver. I mean, I check on mom every day. I buy all mom's groceries. Um, oh, yeah, she needs to, she's not driving. So I'm taking her to the doctor, but I'm not a caregiver. I want to make the case that if you are, you may be a caregiver because you're, you are day to day, hour by hour, 24 seven, supporting someone in your um, life, but you may be a caregiver under, who provides just some of the, that assistance. For example, you might help with household tasks. You might help get or uh, dole out, arrange medications. Maybe once a week you pick up the laundry or once a month you take uh, Aunt Sally to the doctor. All of those things are caregiving activities. In fact, just when you check in with somebody important in your life on, or you um, make friendly calls, you may be providing important care support for another person. How did we get to this, even get to talking about caregiving, especially AARP? How did AARP get involved in this? Do you know that um, the person who started AARP, Dr. Ethel Percy, founded two organizations. One, she had founded a, an organization called the National Retired Teachers Association. And she later, just a few years later, started AARP. And her motivation was seeing people who were inadequately cared for and believing that it's our responsibility to take care of others, whether it's by providing them shelter and food or it's giving something of ourselves to others. She said, it's only in the giving of oneself to others that we truly live. The human contribution is the essential ingredient. So as we move along here, talking about the nitty gritty of caregiving, you know, the work of caregiving, let's keep in mind that what we're doing is really making a connection, supporting another person, giving of ourselves. That's not a lecture. That's a way to say to yourself, wow, wow, I'm doing something important. So I know you're already caregiving, so ignore the title here if you're already providing care, but I want you to think for a moment about what you do uh, for somebody else, for the person who, for whom you're providing care, the person I call the care E, the person who receives the care. You ready for this? The tennis balls are part of your imagination right now. You can close your eyes if you want and imagine that you have a bunch of tennis balls in front of you, okay? And every time I say something that reminds you of something you do, you throw a tennis ball into the air. For example, take the person, I'm gonna say mom or dad just to make it easy, but whoever it is you're providing care for, okay? Take mom or dad to medical appointments. If you do that, throw a ball in the air. Throw a ball in the air if you pick up a prescription. Organize and help ensure that your loved one, mom or dad, let's say, takes medication, takes their medication. Call the insurance company. Shop for groceries. Cook meals. You're throwing your balls in the air? Mow, my, mow the lawn. Do the laundry. Help bathe and dress the other person. Go to work yourself. Take care of another person in your family, maybe your own children. How are the balls looking? You have a lot of stuff in the air? Pay bills for the other person. Take the other person to get a haircut. Maybe change a bandage. How many balls are in the air? How many are falling? How does it feel? When you think of all the things you do, do you have some sense of... <gasps> Oh my heavens, that's a lot. <coughs> uh, 
it's just obvious. If we are if we are caring for a friend or a family member, particularly if we are unpaid uh, caregivers, that is, it's not our profession. We don't do it for eight hours a day. We do it as needed. We are juggling a lot of balls, both for the person we're caring for and also for other people in our lives. So how do we navigate this? ARP, I think, does a really nice job of saying, let's look at this in five steps. Start a conversation, form a team, make a plan, find support, and oh yes, very importantly, care for yourself. And this is something that I said I wasn't going to talk a lot about, but I'm gonna stop for just a second. We are well out of that peak of the pandemic. But I feel obligated to say that as we go along in this presentation, thinking about how to provide care, we still need to keep in front of us the importance of staying healthy, noticing the CD, uh, CDC guidelines for, um, for uh, preventing infection, transmission of diseases. We are right now in a pretty high flu, uh, flu and COVID and RSV plus anything else that might be floating around. So as we think about these things, do keep in, your, in mind, let's do them safely. So step one is starting a conversation. That just sounds obvious, doesn't it? We've got to talk about things, but actually, it's not the kinds of things that we have to talk about with the person for whom we're providing care can be difficult. They can involve illness. They can involve um, taking away some part of a person's independence or reducing a person's independence. I'm gonna start calling the person we're caring for Sally, just so that you can in your mind think of about who you're, uh, and you can substitute the person you're thinking about, okay? It's not infrequent that the discussions we have to talk about are so difficult that neither Sally nor we want to have that conversation. Does that make sense? We notice that Sally is becoming forgetful and we're concerned about Sally continuing to cook in her home because she's not turning off the stove. It's not easy to say to her, you're not doing this in a way that's safe. We need to make changes. So we tend to put off the conversations. Often if the person, if Sally notices their changes, she may put off the conversations or be unwilling to have a conversation about some difficult topics. So what do we do about that? Well, number, we have to know what we're capable of, what concerns us, what we're seeing that concerns us. But we also have to know what Sally is thinking. What are her wishes? What are her concerns? What are her needs? And so I'd like to encourage you to think about this. Um, I guess by thinking about kind and gentle. Not having truth, but having curiosity. Not knowing the solution, but asking questions and coming to solutions together. What's that look like? How do you start a conversation? Just think about it for yourself. Since we're such a big group, we can't talk about it, but let me give you a second to think about a difficult conversation you might need to have and how you might get that conversation started. Would the other person, would Sally, mom, dad, say, no, I'm not talking about that? You're not gonna keep me from cooking? You can't do that? What's your relationship with the person? If you're a child trying to help your parent you have your whole life 
been respectful of that person. That person has had the power, the strength, the authority to tell you things. Now you're sort of reversing the roles a bit or a lot. How do you start those difficult conversations? Here's my suggestion. We don't go into conversations having the answers. We may in our heads think we know the answer, but the first thing we want to do is say what you are, what I am seeing, not you need to do this, you need to stop cooking, but you know, I noticed yesterday that the stove was on when I came in the house and I was concerned. Can you hear the difference? Not you must stop cooking, but I am concerned. And the next thing we want to do is ask with cure is to talk with curiosity, ask questions. Have you noticed that you're, you're not as comfortable in the kitchen now? Have you had some concerns about how well things are going when you try when you're cooking? An I statement and a question, and then listen patiently. Listen carefully. Don't jump in. Let the person tell their story, knowing that they may be a little defensive at first. They may be deny what you're seeing. Take your time. Know that if it's a difficult conversation, you may very well have to have that conversation a number of times before the situation is resolved. You want to look for an opening. When's a, what's a quiet place, a calm place, a calm time to have the conversation? Start with I statements, ask questions, and respect that you're the person you're caring for will have opinions and perspectives and need to listen to them really carefully. You'll probably find that um, finances are one of the really difficult areas to have a conversation about. No question. Uh, people, we in this country particularly have a great deal of privacy around our finances. However, if a person, if if Sally is having, let's say, cognitive issues, we really need to know what her assets are, how she'll be able to continue to live. What if she needs um, in-home care or needs to live in a community? Will she be able to pay for that? How will she pay for it? Does she have money in a bank account? And is there a co-signer for that? What kind of insurance, including long-term care insurance and so forth and so on. We need to make some plans and the plans take first, getting information, having that conversation. And you may talk about legal matters or driving, or as I said, home safety. Any number of things may be the subject of a conversation you feel the need to have. Again, don't push too hard. Make sure there's just time. If Aunt Sally says, no, I'm not talking about this, well then say okay and come back to it again later. Not too far later, but let the stress uh, sort, of, um, sort of wind down a little bit. Again, since we can't talk about this right now, let me give you just a second to picture a conversation that you've had in the past and then we'll move on. And you might have a question about this, you can pop in the Q&A section that we can come back to a little bit later. So we started by having a conversation. What we were really doing was identifying a concern, an issue, identifying it better for ourselves, gathering information better for ourselves, but also engaging, keeping the person we're caring for in the picture so they can say what they're thinking and what their needs are. The next thing we need to do is form a team. <laughs> I'm laughing because caregivers typically think they're it. They're frontline and they do it all. The can't. Uh, the can't. We need care. We need people in the picture for lots and lots of reasons, partly because I don't know anybody who has all the answers, who knows all the facts, who knows all the solutions. So having other people to talk with broadens our understanding about how to address whatever issues come up. Also, one of the biggest problems caregivers have is stress, is 
fatigue is feeling like this is more than they can do for the person they're providing care for, maybe for other people in their lives. So what we want to do is identify friends and family and pe other people in the community, for example, maybe in your faith community, who will participate in providing, who'll be part of the team. Let's just keep that language. They'll be team members. Um, you, you really don't want to have a huge team. You do, if you have 20, 25 people involved, it's, that becomes a complexity in managing all those people, making sure that things don't fall through the cracks can be a problem in and of itself. But having people, having a team that has the skills, the knowledge, the time to provide care for each of them to provide some of those, their skills, some of their knowledge and some of their time uh, can really help make the care providing experience much more manageable, much more manageable. Typically we think of people who live nearby, but you know, people who live far away often can be very helpful as well. Maybe they're the person who checks in and makes a friendly phone call every day or once a week, or maybe they're really, really good at managing schedules. And so they can write up a schedule and um, have check-ins with other people who say that, you know, who are helping. Nowadays in the, in the digital community, there are lots of ways people can be present even if they're not physically there. We also want to think about um, the particular knowledge and skills a person brings to the table. So somebody who is really skillful at carpentry may build that a ramp for the front of the house. And as I said, somebody who's good with online scheduling may take care of that task. And somebody else may just be a warm, fuzzy, caring visitor. Do you have people in your team? Think about who helps you. And if you don't have a team, think about the first two people you might ask because of some special skill or personality trait that would make your job a little bit easier and provide more care for your loved one. So we're gonna sort of clear the air by figuring out what the concerns are. We're gonna have conversations. And then we're gonna be sure there are other people who can share in providing care to make um, the job load a little bit less but also just to round out all the skills and warmth and talents that we need to be successful in providing care. And now we need to know, we need a plan. We need to be pretty clear about who does what needs to be done, who can do it, and when it'll happen. Have you had the experience of having two or three people on your team. But when it comes to who visited Sally last, well, it's just not really clear to you. Whose responsibility was it to check on Sally's laundry last week? And did it happen? And how are you gonna know? So a plan is a way to assign or take on, volunteer for specific activities know when those activities will happen. I'm going to pick up the laundry on Thursdays. I'm going to deliver the laundry on Saturday. And some sort of feedback loop. If I have problems, who will I contact? I can't get the laundry that day. If, if I can't arrange the medications into the little containers um, on Friday when I usually do it, who do I call? How, who picks up the slack? if I'm just not able that particular day. You know, often uh, we provide care for disabilities or illnesses, changes in one in, a per, in Aunt Sally's life or in Sally's life that um, go on for long periods of time, years. 
what provisions do we have for recognizing that a member of the team has to step off and that we need uh, new people in the team? Um, I want to tell you that if you haven't put together uh, this really organized plan, it's helpful to think it through. And there is a, a guide called the Caregiving Guide that AARP offers. I can give you, you can go on aarp.org to find it, but I can also give you the link to it. And it helps you to sort of think about, here are the things I've already got in place, but what else maybe should I have on my, um, you know, in that plan? I had this feeling that I'm going backwards into some of these slides, so could be. Um, now, when you make the plan, you want to make sure everybody on the team is on board and has accepted their responsibility that they're taking on. You want to let them know as changes in the plan take place because things change. The person receiving care may need different kinds of support as time goes on. Take notes, write it down. Be sure you have a record because when you're in the middle of caregiving, the last thing you want to do is try to remember who it is who was supposed to get the groceries this week. Let's write it down. But here's something else. As long as the person receiving care, as long as Sally is capable of participating in the making the plan, even carrying out the plan, as long as she is capable of expressing her needs, her concerns, her desires, even her values. What does she want to look this, this, want this plan to look like? As long as she can participate in the conversation, she ought to, by my values, be in the conversation. We don't want to just make her an object, we want to be sure she has a voice. Does that make sense to you? So often we talk around or about somebody who has um, a health issue or a cognitive issue, physical health issue or a cognitive issue. If the person can participate, it's respectful to them and better information for us if that person's part of the conversation. Again, a second for you to think for yourself. Do you have a plan? How do you think there are things you could plan out even more to make this a bit easier for you? I encourage you to use the AARP Caregiver Guide to help you walk step-by-step step through making your plan. It will really make the job a bit easier. Okay, so now, I made it sound like, and I meant to, that a bunch of unpaid, volunteer, caring, talented, knowledgeable people make up our team. And you may well be the head of the team, you may be a caregiver who's the head of the team. You may be the person receiving care who's the head of the team. But there are all these folks who have stepped up. The fact of the matter is that I often say that there are two things we're not taught in school, very often anyway. One is how to become a grown up. You know, like how to navigate a marriage, how to, how to take care of a baby. We typically typically are not trained to do these things. And we sure shouldn't are not taught, we don't learn any place in our education about aging, illness, caring for somebody. So we don't have all the knowledge and skills that we might have. We have to reach out for more information for people who've had experience or training in some of the things we're called on to do as care providers. We may not know enough about how to help a person move comfortably from the bed to the chair to the bed. We might have to learn that from an expert. We may not know the best foods to feed somebody who's having cognitive changes or who's trying to avoid cognitive changes. We have to learn that. 
And also we don't have, and even if we do learn it, there are some things that we simply have to give to somebody else because there are specialized skills involved that would take a great deal of training that we're not going to have. So what we want to do is look out into the community for other kinds of assistance. Oh, I know what I started to say and, and meant to continue with. We also don't may not have the time or bandwidth to provide every bit of the care, right? We may need support from other people just because we need some more helping hands. So we need to find support out there in the community. And uh, I wanna suggest that there are lots of ways to do that. Um, first of all, there are community resources. And I mentioned a little while ago, faith communities, many of, of us belong to faith communities that have helping hands or aging support or illness support or support groups, all kinds, they're called all kinds, even a minister or a rabbi or an imam whose specially special focus is on uh, providing care for his or her community. But there are lots of other resources available, um, community centers and uh, well, I can provide you with lists, but I can also direct you to AARP, uh, which has community resource finders, folks out in the community who can provide support in terms of time and knowledge and skills. We want to have those available, know who they are so that we can call on them when we need them. And of course, we don't want to forget that um, there are professionals in the community who provide what I told you was the more skilled, the more complex kinds of care that we need sometimes. So they might be people who are psychologists, counselors, life coaches like I am. You might be looking at social workers, uh, trained CNAs or other people trained to come and go into the house to provide a home key, housekeeping support companionship, or more specialized health care. There are nurses and, of course, doctors who can provide support. And then there are those people I was referring to in the earlier part about conversations, lawyers, CPAs, insurance agents, and so forth, provide special information that you need in some areas of, of Sally's life. There are um, lots of resources for finding out more about um, what your community offers. A, a big picture one is to look for it is to look for your area agency on aging. I happen to be in Greensboro, and one of the really good sources supported by area agency on aging and has a lifeline information line where you call all day long and get information about what the resources in the community are. And as I said, AARP, Alzheimer's Association, Parkinson's uh, Foundation, Parkinson's Association, all provide those kinds of information if you reach out for them. I don't want to, um, sort of skip over the idea that sometimes we reach out for care support, not because we don't have the particular information or the skills. We also do it because at some point we can't do it all. We just simply can't do it all. And there are ways to get some help with that beyond the volunteers in your life. So you can hire help. You can hire help, as I just mentioned, to just for companionship from time to time or on a regular basis for home housekeeping, sort of activities of daily living, grooming and uh, things like that. Or you may hire somebody because they uh, there's a need for a higher level skill in terms of the of the illness and the symptoms of the illnesses the person you're caring for has, and you need that specialized care. Home health care agencies, nursing agencies, and so forth can make that connection for you. 
You also um, may want to speak with somebody about um, safety, safety networks, I want to call them. I read a wonderful article, which I'm happy to send to you um, if you like, that I just read yesterday. It was written by Wirecutter and it listed, I went looking for this and found it. It listed all of uh, all kinds of digital devices that you can put in a person's home, not to spy on them, not to be, you know, looking over their shoulders, but to ensure their safety. Now, if you have some of these devices, it may be you're in a situation where if you just know the person is can reach you if they need to, then you don't need to be there quite as much. So there are devices that detect falls. There, de there are devices where a person can just speak out. You know these, like the Alexis and the Dot, where uh, they're always listening. And so if Sally were needing something, she could just say, Alexa, call my daughter. Or Alexa, you know, it, uh, call the EMS. Or Alexa, turn off the lights. There are cameras, of course, there are um, digital locks, there are even um, devices that turn the stove off. They haven't been well um, reviewed yet, but they exist. The other thing you want to do is find out about housing options. If housing changes, residential changes need to be made. There is an enormous amount of information available so that you don't have to do this by just sort of driving from one place to another, you can gather information. There are people who specialize in helping, uh, helping you understand what the options are and find the best fit if there's going to be a change in residence. And of course, you know this, there are support groups. And I think they are among the most important things, belonging to a support group where you get information and you just get that community, I think is enormously important. I have been talking and talking and talking at you, which I hate to do, but I hope you're picking up some ideas. And I'm going to leave you, um, not leave, but I'm gonna stop talking. After I say what I think is an incredibly important thing, you have to care for yourself. You have to care for yourself. It's not a luxury to care for yourself. It's, it's important to care for yourself if you don't stay healthy, if you don't keep your stress levels at a reasonable level, if you don't take time for yourself, it's impossible to provide ongoing care in um, as complete and satisfactory way as you want to. So I've said all these things, but when you think about them as ways of caring for yourself, of me, uh, they have a different complexion. What are the resources available? The volunteers in your village, your group, the professional volunteers, the people who are out in the community who aren't your special friends, but they're still gonna show up because they work at, they volunteer at a church or a community center or someplace else, and they can come do something that you need done. They can build that ramp that you need for a wheelchair, where they can come make a friendly visit so that Sally has some companionship and you can take a breath. Technology means, often means, that you can be a little more relaxed about safety issues and communication issues and staying in touch with Sally, even if you're not physically there. Um, I've not mentioned this before, but think about whether there are, is any assistance provided by your employer in terms of leave or support. Many, especially bigger employers are able to do this. You wanna keep your eye on the legal issues and the financial issues to make sure they're in place. You don't wanna get trapped in a place where you're doing a lovely job, but you've run out of money and really directly take care of yourself. Be sure that you're checking with your own physical health, that you talk to your doctor about the responsibilities you have and the stresses that you may be feeling. Speak up. 
If you need some support, if you need somebody to come into the house today, you've been with Sally all week and you just need to get to your doctor's appointment or you need to get your hair done or you need to go to a class, say so. Tell the other people in your team. And I've already said this a couple of times, take, a care, take advantage of caregiving services and support that's available in your community and make a way to take a breath. Make a way to de-stress. Get to the gym class, exercise, eat well, have time off from your caregiving responsibilities. It refreshes you. It makes it possible for you to continue to be a really good, caring, effective caregiver, the person who you surely are and want to continue to be. There are an awful lot of support, supports out there. Um, again, if you would just download the AARP Caregiver Guide, you will find so much information. But if you're jotting things down, you might look particularly at aarp.org backslash caregiving. Um, the Community Resource Finder is actually um, an a very, very good um, way to find out what's available near you. It's uh, sponsored by both Alzheimer's Association and AARP. You go to aarp.org backslash CRF for Community Resource Finder. And you can learn lots more just by going to learn.aarp.org. I haven't included because it's an AARP presentation and I didn't think to do it, but I have not included resources uh, uh, directly about Parkinson's and Parkinson's um, um, yeah, well, par resources that will support that come from Parkinson's Association, Parkinson's Foundation, but um, I'm sure that you have access to those. So we had five steps. Uh, see if I can do it. Communication, team, building a team, your plan, uh, other resources, and taking care of yourself. And now I really want to hear from you. So if you have, uh, let's see what kind of questions you have asked or um, but ask in the Q&A, or maybe I guess we'll, we'll do it all through Q&A, right? Yes. So if at this time, if you have any questions, um, you don't have to use the chat box. You can actually unmute yourself. Um, but let me double check the chat box and make sure that there's none in there. Um, and also another tidbit for you all. So I did put the link to the AARP care caregiving guide for everyone in the chat box um, when Dr. Greenberg mentioned it. Um, so if you'd like to go ahead and snag that link um, while it's available to you. If not, you can follow up with me afterwards and I can share it. Are we question free? <laughs> Um, well, I have a question, if no one else does. Um, uh, I help my mom take care of my dad, and um, but very minimally, because um, he really only wants her to, to help him. Um, how do you, um, I think she would maybe take a break to take care of herself if she felt like that wouldn't be so devastating to him to have someone else help. And I, I just wonder, do you have any advice for that um, that dilemma? I understand why <laughs> um, he only wants her because that's his, you know, that's his comfort zone and that's his safe person for, you know, almost 50 years now. So I understand that. But um, I just really worried about what, what will happen to her if this dynamic continues. What have you tried? Um... So <laughs> tried just having me sit with him while she goes and runs an errand or something. Um, but he he really feels pretty uncomfortable with that. I mean, just kind of just doing it, just 
talking to him about how she needs to, there are certain things she needs to do and if, you know, that she needs to do by herself and then, and then we kind of just, just do it. Um, just have her go and me stay. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of the extent of what we've tried so far. Okay. Well, I think that's, I think that's great. Um, I don't know the, what your father is, is experiencing. Is he cognitively um, in t okay? Can, can he process okay? I, it seems like no, <laughs> um, because he doesn't seem to understand um, that there's certain things she needs to do. Like if she has a doctor appointment or something, he, he like, spins it in his mind that she doesn't actually need to go. She needs to stay with him. And mm. I don't think that's him being, you know, yeah. Selfish. I think that's him really like his anxiety is so overwhelming and his cognitive ability is, um, is such that he, he can't, he can't process it enough together. Yeah. Right. So, um, this is a team. We now have like 21 people on this. Well, we have 19 now on this team. Would anybody like to make a suggestion before I do? What would you, what would you do in your situation? I think one thing I would ask is dad, what makes you uncomfortable when mom leaves? Mm-hmm. Depending on, I love that. I think that's, you know, let's get it out there. Something's going on here. Can you tell me about it? Right. And it gives him a voice. It gives him a chance to say, but what if something goes wrong? Ah, you're a kid. You're a baby. What do you know? She'll know. But you, you know, you might hear things like that. So if he's able to answer that question, I think it's a great question. If he's not, then I would start on the presumption that maybe then you do some what I call when I'm talking to people with um, with any dementia. I try to crawl into their reality. I try to guess what's going on and then I act on my guess. So if I thought, well, he might be worried that I can't take care of him because I'm then I might say to him, you know, I'll bet you think I can't take care of you. But you know what? I can. And I am going to so enjoy spending a few minutes with you alone without mom. I love her to death, but this is our time. In other words, I would, if I could, I would try to number one, address what might be concerning him. Just address it. You're probably, you don't think I can do this, but really I do know how to I do know how to be with you. I do know how to take care of you. And the other thing is to add something that you think would be enjoyable for him. Like I would love to spend time with you, or this is our chance to watch. Um, I don't know some show on TV. He likes let's, let's, let's just go watch the football game while mom's gone. Or you know what, dad, we haven't had a chance to look at these pictures of the kids in a long time. How does that sound? Just sort of, you're guessing for him, but you're also you're also offering him something. Right, that's helpful. And I think what you said about just letting him talk, giving him the space, and um, it may be validating what his fears are. Are um, yes, that's the language exactly. It's validating it if you, and you know, try it out. Don't say you are afraid, but you say. Geez, it seems like you're worried. You know, give him some give him some leeway to say, no, that's not it. Now, often if a person has a dementia, they have a very poor sense of time. And so if the dementia is at that point, then you might want to say something like, Mom has to go to the doctor. Mom needs a little bit of time at the gym. She's going to be gone an hour. I'm going to put the clock here so we can both pay attention to when we can expect her back. Does that make, you see what I'm saying? Sort of yeah. close in on the fears. Anybody else want to add to this or have another question? 
Thank you for that question. It was really helpful. Thank you. Anybody else? Was there anything I said that you wanted to say, oh my heavens, that's ridiculous. I wouldn't do that. Or I didn't think of that before. Looks like we're good. Okay. Okay. I'll just I thank you. Mike had a question. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, I want to know how do you balance between somebody giving care and the other person taking care of themselves? How do you balance between those two issues? Somebody that can do or wants to do things for themselves, but also as a caregiver, how do you know which is which? And how do you balance those two requirements? Uh, so let me be sure I understand. The person who's receiving care wants to do for themselves? Yes, some yeah. stuff. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, how do you, you, yeah. Do you, you know, one of the things about a progressive illness, you know this, is that the word progressive is leading, right? right. It, everything changes over time. And so you make all of your decisions in the moment, right? Right. Not literally, but this week, these three weeks, this month, things are going this way. Um, and so I think, remember I said we have to play detective. It's another way that we play detective is to try, is to try to figure out how much the person is capable of doing and to honor that. If a person can do something, this is my professional opinion, mm -hmm. but not truth. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that what we want to do is respect the, uh, the person who's receiving care to honor what they can still do for themselves, to honor their needs and desires and delights. In other words, so I would say that you have, I would say that if a person wants to do for themselves and they are safe doing it and relatively successful doing it, you should let you, you as a, a person, the caregiver should let it go. It may take longer. There may be imperfections. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Sally wants to dress herself and she doesn't, she says, I am not a baby and I don't need somebody dressing me. But the clothes go on in the wrong order. Right. But there's nothing, there's nothing like a pair of undies on the outside of a skirt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so while we may recognize it's not going to hurt Sally to dress herself, it's not a particularly success, it may not be completely successful. So we might then modify, right? Sally dresses herself, but we put the clothes out on the bed in a certain order. Or we don't even show the skirt until the undies are on. So we grad, we, we manage the, be the activity to the extent that we have to, but not more than we have to. I like that. Manage it only as much as you have to. And how about the person receiving the care how do they communicate, uh, you know, effectively showing appreciation for the person wanting to help them, but yet saying, look, I think I can do this. So um, I appreciate your help and all that, but I'd really like to do it myself. How do you, how do you do that so not to create uh, strife and um, bad feelings? You know, one of the real realities of, of any kind of um, dementia, I mean, a person who is, whose faculties are intact, who can process and, and speak, and to, that's not where your problem is. It's somebody who, who's having some cognitive problems, right? Mm -hmm. So the rule of thumb with cognitive problems is that the person with the cognitive problems is doing what they are capable of doing, not more or less. So if they've forgotten how to say thank you, presuming they always did say thank you in the past, right? Mm. Now they're not appreciative or they don't show appreciation. They're not going to relearn that. And our best job, our best um, outcome is to, as the care provider, 
is to keep saying to ourselves, this is the disease. This is, it's not them being ungrateful. It's not them being rude. This is the best they can do. Okay. You're not going to get, one does not get, no, I won't say it quite like that. You may not get the same appreciation. You may not get someone to tell you they appreciate you or to say, thanks for doing that. I couldn't do it myself because they can't process that. And they and lose it makes filters. it lonely. I'm sorry, they go ahead. They lose their filters. Well, they everybody- wear more or do something different. And it, it's not the person that was there before. It's the change. Let, let me put it this way. Each individual process goes through a dementia differently. So for some people, it means not having the same filters and saying really nasty things cursing when they never cursed before <laughs> hollering when they never hollered before or hollering and they did holler before but they're not in necessarily in control of that the disease has changed their brains somebody else may become a warm fuzzy just a warm my mother was one stickler of a person she could tell you what she wanted when she had Alzheimer's disease, she was the warmest, fuzziest person who said, I love you and thank you all the time. Well, that would be, it. for me, that was lovely, right? If she had been striking out at me and calling me names, it would have been felt hurtful. I was lucky. But if she had been striking out at me, I would have had to say to myself, she can't help this. This is the disease. Yeah. And then I would have had to say, take a deep breath. This is the best she can do. I'm going to have to keep caring for her. I want to keep caring for her, but I'm not going to expect that she's going to say thank you. Does that make sense? Is that yep. all the flexibility is on our side because the person with the dementia simply can't do more than they're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? No? <laughs> okay. Well, we will go ahead and wrap up today's session. Um, I would like to say thank you to you all for joining um, and contributing to the discussion today. And thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for all this lovely information. Um, as a reminder to um, everyone, um, this information will be, or this webinar will be available later on YouTube. Um, but if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to me um, at the office or at my email address. Um, but yes, thank you all. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh.